Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to Zion's Bank Corporation's fourth quarter 2020 earnings results webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. It is now my pleasure to introduce Director of Investor Relations, James Abbott. Thank you, Andrew, and good evening. We welcome you to this conference call to discuss our 2020 fourth quarter and full year earnings. I would like to remind you that during this call, we will be making forward-looking statements, although actual results may differ materially. Additionally, the earnings release, the related slide presentation, and this earnings call contain several references to non-GAAP measures. We encourage you to review the disclaimer in the press release or the slide deck on slide two dealing with forward-looking information and the presentation of non-GAAP measures, which applies equally to statements made during this call. A copy of the full earnings release as well as the supplemental slide deck are available at ZionsBankCorporation.com. We will be referring to these slides during this call. For our agenda today, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Harris Simmons will provide a high-level overview of key financial performance. President and Chief Operating Officer Scott McLean will provide comments on our recent strength in certain strategic areas. Finally, Paul Burtis, our Chief Financial Officer, will, pro- will conclude by providing additional detail on Zion's financial condition. With us also today on the call are Keith Mayo and Michael Morris, our Chief Risk Officer and Chief Credit Officer, respectively, who will be responding to questions you may have regarding credit quality. We intend to limit the length of this call to one hour. During the question and answer section of the call, we ask you to limit your questions to one primary and one follow-up question to enable other participants to ask questions. I will now turn the time over to Harris. Harris? Thanks very much, James. We want to welcome all of you to our call uh, this afternoon. Beginning on slide three, uh, we are very pleased with the overall results this quarter. One very significant driver of the increase in earnings per share from the prior quarter was the reduction in the allowance for credit loss, which when coupled with only 13 basis points of annualized loan losses relative to average non-PPP loans, resulted in a negative provision for credit losses of nearly $70 million. Although we continue to expect that uh, credit losses will remain elevated relative to our long-term trend level, and there's continued uncertainty with respect to the ultimate impact to borrowers from the pandemic, We've been very encouraged by the uh, resiliency of a great many of our customers. Adjusted pre-provision net revenue was $280 million, reflecting a slight linked quarter decline in net interest income and stable customer-related fee income. Notably, the adjusted PPNR figure is slightly higher than the year-ago period, helped by income from the Paycheck Protection Program. As we've noted numerous times over the last several years, we were resolved to enter whatever downturn was on the horizon with strong relative and absolute capital ratios. A 10.8% common equity tier one capital and an allowance for credit losses relative to loans of 1.75% on non-PPP loans. We still maintain one of the strongest combinations of CET1 and the ACL um, within the large regional banking space. To that end, we've stated that we'll consider increasing capital distributions as the storm passes, and we are hopeful we are approaching a point where we will resume share repurchases, although it's premature to announce anything today. Earlier, I noted the strength we saw in net charge-offs, but there are other credit indicators that showed signs of stability, notably non-performing assets, classified loans, and loans on deferral. Perhaps one of the most, uh, more Surprising numbers for the quarter was the net charge-offs realized on the loans that we grouped into the COVID-19 elevated risk category. The ratio rounds to zero, which is certainly not what we would have expected early in, earlier in the, uh, in the year, in, in 2020. Throughout the quarter, we've seen real-time consumer and business spending data that's been encouraging. For example, for the month of December, a customer's debit card spending was 11% more than the year ago month of December and credit card spending, which has often been negative when compared to the year-ago period, weighed down in part by travel and entertainment spending, was slightly positive from the same month, same month a year ago. 
Slide four is a quick summary of some key performance indicators for the, for the full year as compared to the prior two years. Although net income, return on assets, and earnings per share decline, James, we may have lost uh, Harris there. Okay, uh, so Scott, would you like to remember where Harris was, where Harris left off? It looks like we lost Harris's audio. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. I think we were on slide four. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, this is Scott McLean, and I'll pick it up from here. And if Harris reengages, we'll uh, slot him back in. So on slide four, uh, it's a, a quick summary of some key performance indicators for the full year as compared to the prior two years. Although net income, return on assets, and earnings per share declined, you can see on the chart on the top right that pre-provision net revenue was fairly stable and would have increased slightly by about $11 million if we had excluded the charitable contribution of $30 million that was related to our success with PPP round one. Similarly, the efficiency ratio would have been 58.3% in 2020, if not for the charitable contribution, a modest improvement to the level achieved in 2019. Hey, Scott, I'm, I'm back. My, my apologies. I lost my connection there. Terrific. Um, I'll hand the ball back to you, Harris. We're on slide five. I'll pick one slide five. Thank you for filling in. Slide five is a depiction of our earnings per share with a significant increase in EPS in the fourth quarter of 2020, largely attributable to the change in provision expense. Turning to slide six, adjusted uh, pre-provision net revenue was $280 million in the fourth quarter as, uh, as noted. The prior quarter was adversely affected by the $30 million charitable contribution, uh, which would have uh, made the prior quarter's number $297 million. The moderate decrease from the prior quarter was largely attributable to a slight decrease in revenue as well as, as an increase in expense, which Paul will provide detail in his prepared remarks. On slide seven, uh, we highlight the balance sheet profitability metrics. Obviously, the negative provision has resulted in a level of profitability that is not sustainable in the long run, similar to our view that the depressed profitability in the early part of the year was also not likely to persist. As we enter 2021, I'm encouraged with the progress made on the technology front that has enabled us to do things faster and at a lower cost. We're optimistic that non-PPP loan growth will resume as we get further into 2021 as the economy further strengthens after a challenging year. We remain sanguine that some of our initiatives, the seeds of which were planted years ago, will bear more fruit, including mortgage banking, wealth management, and loan syndications. The next section of slides will be covered by Scott McLean, uh, and so I'll uh, turn the time back over to Scott. Thank you, Harris, and good evening uh, again to everyone. Uh, let me direct you to slide eight. Uh, over the last few months, uh, you've heard us talk about our success with round one of the Paycheck Protection Program. Given the negative uh, economic impact of the pandemic and the low interest rate environment, our oversized success with PPP 1.0, as we describe it, has resulted in a meaningful cushion for near-term earnings, as well as creating new business opportunities with our core small business customer base. Additionally, our new future core system has proven to be helpful in handling this significant PPP volume in several meaning, meaningful ways, including its API enablement. We are now engaged in the forgiveness aspect of the program. Approximately 10,000 customers, representing $1.3 billion of volume, have received SBA forgiveness approval. Of note, over 80% of these loans are less than 150,000, and on average, in excess of 95% of the loan balance has been forgiven. We have a highly controlled process for handling the forgiveness phase, and we've engaged uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to assist which is part of the non-interest expense increase referenced by Harris. Round two 
launched last Wednesday, January the 13th. Last week, we trained over 1,500 frontline bankers in the elements of the program, and as of yesterday, we have taken approximately 20,000 applications. So far, these applications are smaller on average than the average we experience for PPP 1.0. While it's too early to say how round two will compare to round one, we are ready and able to provide the resources to get the stimulus money into the deposit accounts of small businesses that are in great need at this time. Turning to slide nine, we've also frequently highlighted that our bankers have been laser focused on actively calling on the 47,000 PPP 1.0 recipients, more than 40 of which represent new to bank customers. Regarding our existing customers, you can see that these were active relationships with 3.8 billion in deposits and 3.6 billion uh, in, lo uh, in loans. While we have been successful in originating a significant amount of new loans and services, this portfolio of existing customers will experience churn re reflecting the impact of the pandemic and the historical rate of attrition that we experience. Additionally, we were able to strengthen relationships by reaffirming a specific banker for 80% of these approximately 32,700 customers. Further reflecting a deepening of these relationships, the new loans we have originated for these customers has on average been greater than their PPP loan. Regarding the 14,700 new to bank customers, 30% are now actively using their DDA account, and we are seeing good initial loan activity with these small businesses as well. Although we know that we will not be able to retain all of these clients, we are pleased with these early results. Finally, it's our observation that many small businesses have been resourceful in building liquidity, and it would appear that a number of these small businesses still have a significant amount of their original PPP loan funding available in their deposit accounts. This should represent a real source of financial strength as we continue to navigate the pandemic. Finally, advancing to slide 10, uh, 2020 has been a very successful year in our history for our mortgage banking group driven in no small part by the rollout of our ZIP mortgage digital customer facing application process, which occurred prior to uh, the significant decline in interest rates and the significant increase uh, in, in mortgage originations in the country. The combination of these two factors, among others, led to substantial increase in mortgage banking revenue, with loan sales revenue increasing to 54 million from approximately 17 million in 2019. That's 54 million for the full year 2020 versus 17 million in 2019. This new process has also allowed us to reduce our turn times by 25% and improved our service levels. Originations exceeded 800 million uh, in, in, for three quarters and our pipeline at the beginning of 2021 uh, is higher than the year-ago level by 66%. Next, I'll turn the call over to Paul for remarks uh, on credit and uh, additional detail on our financial performance and condition. Paul? Thank you, Scott, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'll begin my comments on uh, slide 11. Generally, we have presented the credit quality ratios in our earnings presentation materials excluding PPP loans. As Harris noted, classified loans and non-performing loans were somewhat stable with the prior quarter. Overall net charge-offs were 13 basis points and for the year, just 22 basis points. About four-fifths of the fourth quarter and one-third of the full year net charge-offs were attributable to the oil and gas portfolio. Consistent with our credit loss allowance of $104 million against that portfolio, we do expect energy loan charge-offs in the future. However, with the improvement in commodity prices and some of the restructurings that have taken place, our credit loss reserve on this portfolio reflects an improving outlook. On the left side of slide 12, we engage very early in granting payment deferrals and payment modifications to our borrowers as the pandemic worsened. At December 31st, loans on payment deferral status were 0.5% of non-PPP loans. The right side of this page shows loans that are over 90 days past due. 
Please note, at the bottom of these bars are statistics regarding total loans that are delinquent by 90 days or more and still accruing. This has recently remained relatively steady between two to three basis points of non-PPP loans. Advancing to slide 13, the industries represented here are those which we believe to have the greatest risk of default in the current environment. As shown on the right side of the page, the collateral coverage is excellent for this $4 billion of loans, with 98% being covered by collateral, often by real estate. Within these loans, collateralized by real estate, the median loan-to-value ratio is 53%, and only 3% of these loans have LTV ratios greater than 90%. Slide 14 presents the three groupings highlighted on the previous slide in a time series format. The top left chart shows the loan balances in columns with the weighted average risk grade shown in the three lines. As indicated by the lines, the elevated risk portfolio experienced some risk grade improvement since September, as did the remaining portfolio excluding oil and gas lending. The oil and gas portfolio's weighted average risk grade remained relatively unchanged. The loan grades shown here represent the probability of default only. As a reminder, the probability of default combined with the loss given default are key drivers of the allowance for credit loss. The top right chart on slide 14 shows the trend in classified and non-accrual loans with the classified ratio being the larger number and the non-accrual ratio being the smaller number within each bar. The relative stability of the other loans non-accrual ratio, which represents 87% of the total non-PP loan portfolio is encouraging in the current economic environment. On the bottom right, you can see the net charge-offs related to these groups. The oil and gas portfolio accounted for about four-fifths of the quarter's total net charge-offs, while a very small amount of net charge-offs came from the elevated risk portfolio. Slide 15 details our allowance for credit losses, or ACL. On the top left, you can see the recent trend. The total ACL was $835 million at December 31st, or 1.74% of non-PPP loans. On the right side, we describe the factors leading to the ACL change in the most recent quarter. The bar chart on the bottom right shows the broad categories of change. $3 million of the ACL decrease is due to the net impact of changes in economic forecasts and changes in the probability weightings of those forecasts. Credit quality factors represented by the middle bar include risk grade migration and specific reserves against loans, which combine for a $20 million reduction in the ACL when compared to the prior quarter. Finally, portfolio changes driven by the aging of the portfolio, the shift in the portfolio from segments that have a higher ACL, such as consumer mortgages and oil and gas, and toward segments that have lower ACL uh, allowance for credit losses attached to them, such as municipal lending, and other similar factors generated a $59 million reduction in the ACL. Slide 16 shows an overview of net interest income and the net interest margin. The chart on the left shows recent trends in both. The net interest margin in the white boxes has compressed in the current quarter relative to the prior quarter. However, as shown in the chart on the right, the compression is essentially attributable to the composition of earning assets, namely a greater concentration of lower yielding money market and investment securities. The change in the composition of earning assets has been driven by the strong growth in deposits. Average deposits increased $1.8 billion, while average loans, including PPP, declined by a $1 billion. As a result, average money market investments and securities increased $3.1 billion when compared to the prior quarter. Slide 17 highlights loan and deposit growth and breaks them down by both rate and volume. As shown on the left side of the chart, average non-PPP loans were lower by about $600 million, while period-end non-PPP loans were down by only about $30 million. Average PPP loans declined $1 billion, while period-end PPP loans declined $1.2 billion. PPP forgiveness reduced PPP loan balances in a quarter, and this is expected to continue into 2021. Turning to yields on loans, the overall yield increased three basis points from the prior quarter. The increase in PPP loan yields from 3.50% to 
to 3.50% from 3.03% in the prior quarter is an important factor in the overall loan yield. PPP loans account for nearly 12% of average loans, meaning that a 47 basis point differential uh, or increase in the PPP loan yield about five basis points to the total loan yield. Partially offsetting that positive change, the yield on new loan production, including line draws, was modestly lower than the yield on maturing loans and paydowns. This trend, trend, this trend remained consistent with the third quarter. The resulting yield on non-PPP loans decreased about three basis points from the prior quarter. Shifting to the chart on the right and funding, average total deposits increased 2.7% over the prior quarter. The cost of deposits declined to eight basis points from 11 basis points in the prior quarter. Slide 18 reports that our balance sheet sensitivity has increased as deposits have increased and benchmark interest rates have fallen. We are comfortable with the increase in rate sensitivity because we believe the risk to lower rates is limited. As indicated in October, and as you can see in the balance sheet tables in the press release, we deployed some of the increase in deposits into securities. The securities purchases for the quarter had an average yield of about one and a quarter percent, 1.25. The purchase activity helps to offset some of the deposit-fueled growth in asset sensitivity, but the absolute level of asset sensitivity is still unusually high relative to our long-term history. The charts on the right side of the page, that page 18, show the interest rate risk, sorry, the interest rate reset profile of our loan portfolio and include additional detail on the interest rate swap book. On the upper right, the volumes, maturities, and associated fixed rates for swaps used to hedge our floating rate loans are shown, while the bottom right highlights loan repricing characteristics. On slide 19, consumer-related fees were stable with the prior quarter at $139 million. Mortgage loan sale revenue declined $8 million and was offset by broad-based improvement in several other categories, including interest rate swap sales revenue, which is found in the capital markets and foreign exchange line, as well as wealth management fees and retail fees. Non-interest expense, shown on slide 20, was $424 million in the fourth quarter. After normalizing for the $30 million charitable contribution in the prior quarter, the $12 million increase in non-interest expense included an increase in incentive compensation as credit quality and overall profitability was better than had been expected earlier in the year. Total compensation and benefits for the full year, excluding severance, was $28 million less in, than in 2019, or 2.5% 2 lower. Average full-time equivalent employees declined about 4.5% in 2020 as compared to 2019, while period-end full-time equivalent employees declined nearly 6%. Helping to drive these savings are continued efforts to streamline and simplify our operations where possible, which has been enabled in part in part by our investments in technology. As an example of that, can be seen in the application of automation in our workspace. Our technology and operations group has been able to incrementally automate an estimated 285,000 hours of labor in 2020, a significant savings for our organization. We also reported an increase in our professional and legal services expense. About $3 million of that increase was related to forgiveness the forgiveness process for PPP round one loans. The remainder of the increase can largely be attributed to ongoing technology initiatives. We are reintroducing our financial outlook, which we suspended for much of 2020 due to the extreme uncertainty surrounding the pandemic. Our updated outlook can be found on page 21 and is our best general estimate of our financial performance in the fourth quarter of 2021 as compared to the fourth quarter of 2020's actual result. Quarters in between are subject to normal seasonality, and I would reiterate our earlier reference to the forward-looking statement on slide two. We are establishing our loan growth outlook, which excludes PPP loans at slightly increasing, which can be interpreted as a growth rate in the low single digits. We expect low single digit to mid single digit growth in commercial driven by an expectation for continued solid growth in municipal lending. We expect commercial real estate to be relatively stable, and we expect consumer lending to experience low single-digit growth. We are establishing our outlook for net interest income, also excluding PPP loan revenue, at 
slightly increasing, which incorporates the current shape of the yield curve, some earning asset growth, and some modest pressure on the net interest margin as the securities portfolio yield continues to reset lower and we ex uh, experience modest pressure on loan yields. We are establishing our outlook for customer-related fees at slightly increasing. Mortgage banking income may be subject to some weakness if longer-term interest rates rise, but we expect strength from many other revenue categories, especially as we deepen and strengthen relationships with our PPP customers. We are establishing our outlook for adjusted non-interest expense at generally stable. As noted in the comments section on this page, on a GAAP basis, we expect the overall level of GAAP non-interest expense in 2021 to be consistent with GAAP non-interest expense for 2020 at about $1.7 billion. Finally, regarding capital management, we feel very good about the strength of our common equity tier one ratio at 10.8%, particularly when paired with the relatively low credit losses and relatively stable pre-provision net revenue throughout the pandemic. It is premature to announce any share repurchase program today. However, we have said that as uncertainty subsides, the prospects of actively managing our capital through share repurchase improves. Of course, the approval of any repurchase program is subject to approval by our board of directors and our regulators. That concludes our prepared remarks. Andrew, would you please open the line for questions? Certainly. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from the line of Erica Nigerian with Bank of America. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the prepared remarks and the financial outlook. Um, you know, as, as we think about um, a, a more upbeat tone on, on the future, as we think about net interest income and the cadence of it, between 4Q20 and 4Q21, should we expect that net interest income would have bottomed in the fourth quarter of 20 X um, any PPP loan income? Uh, well, I'll take that, Erica. Um, I, I, I'll start by saying that you, you saw in the outlook that what we, what we said was that um, you know, we expect uh, net interest income in the fourth quarter of uh, 2020 um, to be sort of uh, modestly above what it is today in, um, I'm sorry, in 2021, relative, modestly above where it is today in 2020. So I, I can't kind of officially call that a bottom, but uh, I think what we're saying is, excluding PPP, uh, we expect it to be uh, growing modestly from here. Got it. Um, that's great. And just on capital management, you know, your um, – so shift to quality has clearly been borne out in the credit quality that we're seeing in the middle of the pandemic. What, and you have, um, you know, significant capital levels, even relative to peers. What would you need to see uh, to buy back stock in the first quarter, which the Fed is allowing for your larger and arguably more complex peers? Well, I think, I think we just want to continue to see a little, uh, a little more clarity with respect to how this pandemic uh, uh, will affect borrowers. There have been a lot of people who thought that uh, we may have a, a little bit of a um, some delayed impact, uh, that we might see more impact coming in 2021. I think, you know, we we're growing increasingly optimistic uh, as as evidenced by the reserve release you saw from us in the fourth quarter, but we still think there's, uh, you know, there's, there's still risk out there. And so we'll, I, it will be cautious, but I, I, uh, I expect that, uh, um, that uh, we'll absolutely be helping to look at share buybacks as we get uh, into 2021. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Dave Rochester with Compass Point. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Hey, on, on the NII discussion, uh, you guys mentioned new loan yields were still maybe a little bit below book yields or maybe it was roll-off yields. Just wondering what, how large that differential is at this point. And then just regarding the, the NII guidance, how much securities growth are you guys assuming in that? 
Uh, I'll take that, uh, Dave. Um, the, uh, as it relates to loan yield, we haven't been specific. I think the word we used in the third quarter Q was modest, and, and what we're trying to say is, you know, that what we're continuing to see is um, 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 similar to that uh, in terms of that uh, quantification, but we haven't been super specific about what that is. Um, but, I th I, but I think it's a fair word, uh, modest. Um, the, uh, as it relates to um, securities growth, you know, we're being, we have a lot of cash uh, on the balance sheet today. You saw that. Um, you saw that impact our net interest margin. Um, we are working, the whole finance team, the treasury team are working really hard uh, to sort of actively manage that cash. But we also are mindful of um, a view that the economy could really begin to engage in the second half of the year. And so we're given the very flat uh, nature of the yield curve and um, I would say a general expectation internally that things will really improve as we, or start to really improve as we get into the next half of this year. We want to be careful about putting on too much duration uh, with that incremental cash that's been, uh, that's been added. So the securities, it's a long way of saying the securities portfolio may grow, um, but you won't see it grow anywhere close to uh, the amount of excess cash that's been put on over the course of the last quarter. Yep. Okay. Great, and then maybe just switching to loans real quick on uh, on your outlook for loan growth. Uh, how much more runoff are you guys expecting uh, at this point in the energy book? And then bigger picture as you think about CNI demand and maybe small business loan demand going forward. Uh, does the PPP program does that impact uh, what that uh, loan demand could be for that uh, that subset of uh, CNI going forward? Just given that they're now flush with cash and, and will be probably spending some of that. Uh, in the near term. David Scott McLean, I'll um, speak to the first part of that. I think, uh, well, maybe all of it. The, uh, the energy outstandings are actually about, uh, well, I, I'm not sure how we reflected it here, but there's about $100 million of PPP loans in the energy outstandings. And so, um, uh, you know, excluding PPP, energy outstandings are around 2.1. Uh, billion or so, and uh, that could go down a little bit further, but I do think if uh, oil and gas prices stay where they are uh, and, and maintain some stability there, I think you're going to see increased drilling and you'll see greater utilization of lines of credit. So I, I don't anticipate it, it. It could go down, you know, the next quarter or two some, but uh, I, I think we'll start to see utilization pick up. And uh, I, I do think that for small business lending in general, the, um, you, you know, our borrowers, uh, they are building liquidity. We've seen that. Uh, I think we've seen it across the country. And they still have uh, a healthy proportion of their PPP fundings to rely on as well. So, um, you, you know, I, I think it's going to be the broader economy uh, starting to show real improvement, and we'll we'll start to see lines of credit being utilized at a greater pace as working capital builds up again, and as people start to um, adjust to the post-pandemic environment. I'd also just note that the uh, while they have cash, you know, to obtain uh, uh, forgiveness, uh, it has to be used. Uh, it's really intended to be used to offset. Um, the uh, you know, specific expenses and to keep uh, employees on payroll at a time when revenues have, uh, have been seriously impacted. So, but you know, I, I think for, for a lot of these businesses, they'll, they'll use it that way. And as we get further into the year, uh, the economy really does rebound in a strong way. I think, you know, I, I, I think you'll see them pick up and start to borrow for uh, longer term kinds of investments in, uh, in building their businesses. So that, that would certainly be the hope and my intuition is that that's going to happen. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Ken Zerby with Morgan Stanley. Great, thanks. Um, I guess not to get too deep in the weeds here, but just to go back to your NII guidance, what is the right base on which to gross is slightly increasing. I mean, the, uh, the way I read it is you got the 550 million on slide 16 right now. You subtract out the 26, which is the accelerated piece. But does your guidance, how, how do you account for the non-accelerated 
PPP amortization. Should we back that out as well, or how are you thinking about it? Yeah, hey, Ken, this is Paul. I'll take that. I'm um, sorry if I wasn't clear. I, what, what we're trying to provide is a, um, you know, kind of a, a, an outlook on net uh, interest income excluding PPP. So the way I would think about it is I would look at the average PPP balances uh, in the third, fourth quarter, which I think are $6.3 billion. Those yield is 3.5%. Uh, and so if you completely exclude that, you come up with a, you know, sort of multiply that out and exclude that from your net interest income number, uh, you come up with net, net, net interest income excluding PPP. That's the base that I'm thinking about. Then. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. I'll, I'll do the math if you, if you don't have that right off. Um, I guess maybe, maybe my follow-up question is in terms of that second PPP facility, you know, can you just talk about the pluses and minuses of, of whether Zions could potentially be as active as it was in the first program? I suspect it's smaller, but I'm kind of curious how, what your involvement might be in the second facility. Thanks. Well, it's a, yeah. it's a yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's less uh, funding for it, so it is a smaller program, and it's really largely targeted at, um, at you know, businesses that were particularly hard hard hit. So I think I think nationally you'll see the numbers are down uh, in this round. Uh, will also be down because in, in terms of the dollar volumes, uh, because the, the, the maximum loan amount has been reduced to $2 million. But, you know, that said, I think you're going to be, see a lot of uh, participation by, uh, you know, businesses on the smaller end of the spectrum. And, uh, and we certainly geared up and we're, we're very engaged. And I, I think and I expect that we'll show very well again in the second round. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of John Picari with Evercore IC ISI. Good afternoon. Um, on on the uh, back to the buybacks uh, uh, question, there just want to. I know you mentioned that. You might be interested in, in or in a position to resume buybacks uh, pending um, later in the year, pending board approval and regulatory approval. Um, is this are the regulators in any way keeping you from resuming buybacks right now? Well, we have to. You know, uh, we're a little bit differently situated from from many of our peers in that we uh, um, we're a publicly traded national bank, as you know. And so uh, there's an application that we make to the OCC for a permanent reduction in capital, and that's what it takes to buy back shares. I, you know, I, I, I fully expect that the uh, that they'll be um, reasonable and, and you know, thoughtful about about this. I, I, you know, as I I look at the backdrop, I, you know, what I see is this is a company that has uh, strong capital relative to peers. We have um, um, what's been you know, very solid credit quality certainly relative to peers um, uh, over the last few quarters. Uh, I think that probably, you know, relatively, relatively gets better as we get through some of the energy issues that uh, um, that have uh, increased the charge offs. I, it's still leaving us with very, very low charge offs, but you know, absent the energy uh, charge offs, it, it looks truly great. And, and then you, you have, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we, I don't expect we're going to see, uh, you know, huge loan demand. Uh, we, we expect that we're going to see loans growing, but, but probably not at a pace that's going to absorb uh, uh, a lot of earnings. And so, um, you know, I think the conditions are going to be, you know, pretty good for us to, to be uh, – Pretty actively engaged in the buying back shares as we get uh, into the year, a quarter or two. Um, we just want to make sure that uh, you know that we're being sensible about it, and, um, and you know we'll have that conversation with the regulators and with our board. But but I, I think all the conditions are are going to be there for uh, for a reasonably active buyback pro program. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. And then separately. I just want to see if you can give us an update on um, on the core systems conversion. Any change in your updated you know expected timeline and any change in terms of the 
uh, the cost uh, trajectory, you know, involved in the whole conversion, has that materially changed at all? Thanks. Thank you for that question. Um, we are, uh, you know, the pandemic, uh, there's no question, had an impact on um, on our future core project and, and just on projects in general. I mean, there was there were three months there where uh, uh, it just, it, it was difficult to, uh, continue at the pace we were going and the level of effectiveness. And so, uh, but we got through that, we've adjusted to it. And so originally we were going to uh, uh, have release three, the deposits release, uh, come out in 2022, kind of a phased rollout in early, kind of early to mid 2022. That, that uh, probably has been delayed by six months. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll be continuing to evaluate that. We still have time to, to make up time between now and then, but, uh, uh, but the pandemic has definitely caused a, a, a brief uh, delay in it. And, and in, terms of, in terms of cost, I, I, I just, go ahead, Harris. Oh, Scott, I was also going to make just note that uh, the other, the, another issue that anybody would uh, face with a project like this is is a um, I was going to say reluctance. It's just it just wouldn't be smart as you get further into the fourth quarter to uh, you know we're not going to do it uh, deep into the fourth quarter. So um, there's kind of a window we're going to have to hit. And we you know we hope that we'll be able to hit that, but uh, uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. No, that's a great that's a great point. And in terms of Kind of the ultimate cost and the impact on P&L, our P&L expenses over the next uh, uh, two or three years, and then uh, for the period after go live, uh, it, it's not it, it's not materially different. So um, uh, hopefully that helps. It does. All right. Thank you. And I, I would tell you that <clears throat> our level of excitement about it uh, continues to grow because. When we get to that place, uh, we we will have a five to eight year, maybe ten year uh, head start on virtually every other major bank in the country, and um, and it it really being on our new system during PPP 1.0 absolutely made a difference in the level of volume we were able to do. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Jennifer Demba with Truist Securities. Thank you. Good evening. Um, your net charge-offs of Vermont are very contained this year. Wondering if you're expecting them to rise in 21 and 22 and where they, when you think they could peak. Um, and if you could give us just a little more detail on what you're seeing in those more at-risk portfolios. Thanks. Hey Michael, it's uh, Jennifer. It's Keith. Let me jump in, and I'll I'll turn it over to Michael maybe for a little more detail. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, we're still not seeing any significant uh, negative impacts in terms of charge-offs to the portfolio on those uh, COVID-related industries, and we can get into some a little bit of detail about what those are. But we're not seeing any impacts there. And I think um, this comment's been made a couple of times. Um, as we get through this next round of stimulus to, to help people get around the bend um, and we get to vaccination, uh, which I know a lot of businesses uh, are looking forward to, we, we just we don't see that in the future, but we also don't know what the economy holds. So as it relates to, to that portfolio, we, we haven't seen losses materialize. We don't didn't see them certainly this quarter. We don't see them in the short term. And in terms of the other portfolios, as mentioned earlier, uh, a substantial portion of the charge-offs this past year and certainly this past quarter when the oil and gas portfolios, we don't see any significant charge-offs uh, looming uh, in the next couple quarters in those portfolios. But, uh, Michael, let me turn it to you real quickly and see if you have something to add. Well, I think you covered it well, Keith. Uh, I would only add that I think the unit count around charge-offs might rise a little bit. I'm not sure about uh, the net charge-off ratio, you know, up or down, but we do expect to see uh, some small business failures, although uh, small business is holding up uh, very well, mostly because, uh, you know, I think our borrowers are disciplined 
they're resilient, they had more cash potentially than we thought they did. And now with this stimulus um, and, you know, vaccine and immunity around the corner, I think, uh, I think Keith's hit it on the head. Uh, if I could just add to that, under the um, uh, CECL uh, accounting uh, rules that we're currently living by, we are estimating uh, our credit losses to be $835 million over the lifetime of our of the loan portfolio. And so, um, uh, you know, it's just, a, it's just a really important, I think, punctuation to all of that commentary. Thanks so much. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Stephen Alexa Paulus with J.P. Morgan. Hi, everyone. I wanted to first ask a question yeah. on the strong deposit growth again this quarter. I know 4Q is typically a window dressing quarter, but with no new government stimulus in the fourth quarter, where is all of this incremental liquidity coming from? Are customers just hoarding cash? And how much risk is there is, if rates rise that that could potentially be siphoned out pretty quickly? Well, I'll start. I, you know, it's somewhat speculative. I, as we've referenced, uh, certainly last quarter, and I think this quarter, you know, we, we believe that the uh, you know, significant um, fiscal and other stimulus programs are creating a lot of liquidity in the system. Um, that's washing up on bank balance sheets, uh, including our balance sheets. As I said um, early, uh, earlier on in the response to a question, you know, we have a lot of cash on the balance sheet today, but we're being really mindful about how far out the curve uh, we put that cash to work because, you know, we do think there's a reasonable chance that by the end of the year, you know, some significant part of that uh, uh, may have left the bank. But that, it, I will say that is somewhat speculative. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and Paul, maybe, see, this, this ahead, guy, Scott. Hey, um, you, you know, clearly uh, our DDA, the total deposit ratio, has continued to increase. And, and so th th there will naturally be, you know, probably a, a drop in that. But uh, if you look at our that mix of non-interest bearing to total deposits over a very long period of time, it has been very resistant to periods of increased interest rates. Uh, and I think that people have figured out that's largely a function of our really small customer uh, business customer client base, small operating accounts. It, it just hasn't been that susceptible to uh, rate chasing, basis point chasing. Okay. That's helpful. Um, and maybe for a follow-up, uh, regarding NIM and the pressure you guys have seen from securities and fixed rate loans resetting lower, maybe for Paul, how much steepness in the curve would we need to see to more fully alleviate that pressure? If we get to, I don't know, 2% in the 10 years, is it gone? Like, uh, wh where does that need to be for the, us not to worry about this anymore? Thanks. You know, it, 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 it's hard to be, for me to be really specific about that. I will say the part of the curve that we're particularly focused on is kind of the three- to five-year point in the curve because that's where, at the margin, uh, that's kind of where we're investing, uh, our discretionary sort of part of the balance sheet, the investment portfolio. Uh, to, to the extent we're mitigating or attempting to mitigate the interest rate risk through swaps, that's kind of where that occurs. Um, and, you know, to the extent we've got fixed rate loans, they sort of happen around that, that part, too. So it's hard for me to be really specific um, around what that looks like, although I wouldn't target it to the 10-year. I would probably target it to sort of the three- to five-year part of the curve. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Gary Tenner with D.A. Davidson. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I guess I had a pretty sizable uh, reserve release this this quarter. And I appreciate the color in the slide deck on the moving parts for the quarter. You know, given the positive commentary, you know, in terms of PPP2, uh, you know, vaccinations, et cetera, just trying to get a sense of where you think that provision number could go in the near term. I mean, if if, if we get, you know, a successful vaccine rollout as we go through the spring, I mean, is that just an acceleration of reserve release into 2021 versus 2022? Well, I'll start with that. I, I, you know, the 
Uh, as you know, uh, under CECL, we uh, we need to create the allowance for credit losses that's consistent with our best expectation uh, for the life of loan losses uh, in the book, and that's the that, you know that's the 835 million dollars we set uh, in the fourth quarter. We also noted that you know uh, as the portfolio migrates, as risk ratings uh, as risk ratings improve, as the economic forecast uh, improves to the extent it does, um, we saw that this quarter. Um, to the extent that those things continue sort of over and above where our current expectations are for improvement, uh, uh, then those are, the, those are the things that would lead the allowance for credit losses down. And likewise, uh, a reversal of fortunes on any or all of those uh, you know, could be a, an offsetting factor on the allowance. I'd maybe just add that I, you know, I, think, uh, I think I can speak for all of us here in saying that the fourth quarter charge-off experience uh, was, I mean, we were elated by it. Uh, uh, we, it was certainly not what we were, would have expected in a pandemic. Um, I think it's a little early to know yet whether that was an aberration. Um, but if we, you know, if we see a continuation of that trend in the first quarter uh, and then on into the second quarter, I mean, I, 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 I think absolutely you're going to see some uh, reserve releases. Um, it, it will simply uh, change our outlook as to what the damage is going to look like. You know, and I, and I, you know, and the stimulus uh, that's out there, the vaccine, every everything that uh, uh, you know, I I, 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 I think the real test is going to be in the actual experienced. Uh, charge-offs that we see here this quarter and, and, and maybe even to the end of the second quarter. Okay, thank you for that. And then quick uh, question on uh, time, time deposits uh, down quite a bit this quarter versus the third quarter on average uh, and a 20 basis point decline in, in rate there. Uh, what, what are you booking new or rollover uh, time deposits at right now? And then, you know, do you, do you think that that total outstanding number continues to decline and, and, and what kind of rate do you think you could get to? Uh, yeah, this is Paul. That, that time deposit number largely is sort of a um, kind of a broker CD, uh, so it's sort of a, you know, a, one of many sources of funding for us that historically we've utilized and tried to spread out our sources of funds, including broker CDs. Given the, the massive amount of liquidity that's washed onto the balance sheet over, over the last nine months, uh, we're actually just letting that portfolio run off. So I, I would, it, and it's a relatively short portfolio, so I would expect, uh, as evidenced uh, by the change in the balance this quarter, so I, I would expect that to continue to run off over the course of the next several, uh, course of the next several quarters and, um, frankly, not be replaced. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Ken Oostin with Jeffries. Hi, right, thanks, guys. Um, hey, on the PPP 1.0 slide, I'm just wondering, you know, have you tried to or start thinking about sizing that new-to-bank customer opportunity? It's just interesting to see how much existing customers have with the bank, but I don't want to presume that it's a similar size opportunity. Do you have a way that you're starting to kind of think through that and how much uplift you might get um, on top of what you've seen already come in through new-to-bank customers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you know, uh, we are. <laughs> we can absolutely see everything those 14,700 approximately new to bank customers are doing. Uh, we're tracking their utilization of their DDA account very carefully because that indicates that uh, that's that 30 percent number that they're they're actively moving their relationship, and so uh, that's progressed from obviously zero to 30 percent in a short period of time. So. Uh, we're having lots of interaction. It, this is, uh, we, we know these, we can count these customers uh, in ones, not in hundreds and thousands. Uh, we're keeping track of the calling effort on them through our contact management system. Our CEOs and our bankers are highly focused on it. And so it's hard to know where it'll end up, but we're encouraged by the, you know, the early loan growth and uh, new services growth that we see there, uh, and but I tell you, it, it, it's always more fun to talk about kind of new customers. It's a little sexier, but the approximately 33,000 existing customers, uh, we probably didn't have that close a relationship with some of those, and so this gave us a chance to have a, 
really intimate experience with them, and uh, we're seeing a nice pickup in loans uh, and, and other services and just a strengthening of the relationship there. So, uh, you know, if you were going through a pandemic, you, you, you'd rather have had 47,000 really intimate interactions than just sitting back on your couch in your jammies. So um, we're watching it closely, we're measuring it closely, and uh, when you think about the fact that we've got another 150,000 um, business customers uh, with revenues less than a million dollars that did not apply for a PPP loan, uh, we were pretty energized uh, about the progress we can make during this time period. Got it. Thanks. And uh, follow up for Paul. Uh, Paul, so if I do the math that you implied before, you get the starting point, I think, of around 500 million XPPP NII, and then we'll grow it on top of that. My, my question is, presuming that's right, how do you even start to think about like what PPP lumpiness looks like in terms of reported NII as the next year progresses? Obviously, with more forgiveness, with PPP 2.0 coming out, I presume there might be some left you know, by the end of next year, but is it as much of a guessing game for you guys as it is for us at this point when you think about the the uh, the out year for that? Well, we pro I think we've provided some pretty good statistics on the uh, first round of PPP and sort of the level of forgiveness that we saw in the first quarter. Um, as we noted that the you know and as you know there's a there's a there's a one percent coupon attached to those loans. We had 141 million dollars of unamortized sort of net fees at. at uh, September 30th, that was down to $102 million um, with $26 million of uh, sort of accelerated amortization uh, associated with that. So we're trying to provide all the pieces so that, you know, you can kind of provide your own estimates on how that forgiveness is coming in. I, I would say that, you know, fourth quarter was, you know, a good quarter uh, kind of um, when you think that that was the first quarter of forgiveness. Uh, my expectation is that we're going to see it, um, we're going to see that continue into 2020. Uh, or 2021. So that, that, you know, is you can kind of get your arms around that. But to your point, the, the hard part will be uh, the second round of PPP um, and sort of how fast those come on the books. And then uh, to the extent the borrowers meet the threshold, how quickly those are forgiven uh, by the SBA. That is a lot murkier to me. But, but um, all that being said, uh, I think 2021, um, um, will be, you know, um, for the next several quarters at least, uh, significantly impact, net interest income will be significantly impacted uh, by the existence of, um, um, of the PPP program. And your math is approximately right. I, I came up with a slightly different answer uh, when I did this, you know, a couple of weeks ago. If you look at the yield, $6.3 billion and 3.5% yield uh, for a full year, that's $220 million. Um, and so I divide that by four, and it's like 55 million associated with PPP. Right, and I was just taking it away from the FTE number, so I was just doing 557 minus 55. So I think we're on the same right. page there. Right, got it. Yep. yep. Okay. Thanks a lot, Paul. Okay. Thanks. And our next question comes from the line of Brad Millsaps with Piper Sandler. Hey. Good evening. Brad. Uh, hey, just wanted to uh, follow up on, on expenses. Uh, you guys have done a great job for several years, really keeping uh, a really tight lid on expenses. Uh, looks like the guidance is for flat expenses, at least on a gap basis in 2021. Uh, however, I know uh, in 2020, you had about $60 million related to the donation and uh, I think the termination of the pension. Um, just kind of curious, that would imply about a three or 4% growth rate. Does some of that some of that attributable to some of the things that Scott talked about being delayed, uh, you know, with, with all the uh, technology spend that you guys have going on, or are there other things there sort of juxtaposed against sort of the ongoing expense initiatives that you guys have in place? Paul, do you want to speak to that? And I'll yeah. Add yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, as we, as we reported, we expect, you know, kind of gap expense to be roughly similar. You did point out some unusual items. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, uh, 2020. Uh, but as we look ahead to 2021, um, you know, the continued build out of our technology stack is a really important part of kind of, uh, of what we're doing and an important part of who we're going to. So that is, that is a contributor, uh, certainly, um, uh, to the expenses we expect to see in 2021. Uh, Scott, would you add to that? 
Yeah, I just um, I think you gotta have to look at the longer time period. Uh, you go back to 2014, 2015, and on an absolute basis, our expenses are up about five percent, uh, not annually, just on an absolute basis uh, from that prior time period. And so um, we uh, uh, we we are continuing to invest in technology. Uh, but at the same time, you, you saw us reduce our FTE count by 5% uh, the fourth quarter of last year, and you can absolutely see that in our FTE numbers. So um, we're pretty encouraged about our ability to continue to keep expenses uh, uh, relatively flat, and uh, because we're we just have this again huge bucket of smaller type initiatives like uh, Paul referenced with automation, that uh, are creating savings, uh, not necessarily savings that any one particular one, you know, you go, wow, that's going to change the course of the company. Uh, but what changes the course of a company is when you have a culture of that continuous improvement and it's happening in little pieces all along the way. Yeah, I just, I'd, I'd also just, uh, and it was said earlier, but just to remind, um, uh, expenses in the quarter were um, impacted by the fact that credit quality, uh, uh, as reflected in the charge-off number, was was uh, better than expected, probably. And uh, and so we we did increase uh, accruals for incentive compensation as a result of that. Uh, I mean that that had about a seven million dollar impact on the quarter. We also had some additional costs, uh, uh, kind of professional fees associated with the PPP program. So there were there were uh, it, it, not not that it was a really messy quarter or a noisy quarter, but it was uh, there, you know there were a couple of um, items in there that uh, took expenses a little higher. Great, thank you guys. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Brian Clark with Keith Bruyere Woods. Hey, good evening, guys. And uh, uh, real quick, uh, before the bell, uh, two follow-ups for you, Paul. Um, on the uh, PPP and the forgiveness, uh, you mentioned that uh, you gave some color on the first quarter. Um, are you saying that that was the color on the first quarter of forgiveness, so that was the fourth quarter uh, of 2020? Is that is that true, or did you actually say what you think the forgiveness may impact the first quarter of 2021? Uh, the uh, forgiveness will absolutely impact. So sorry if I misspoke. I, I was trying to refer to the fourth quarter, uh, and I think we've got some statistics in here in terms of the number of loans that were, you know, it's on the front page of that press release, right? Uh, number of loans that were uh, forgiven. My my point is is that we still have a lot of loans to work through the process, um, and so I'm I'm expecting that to absolutely impact, uh, you know, net interest income uh, for the next couple of quarters. And then PPP 2.0, as we like to call it, um, yeah, that, that is sort of, an, uh, as I said earlier, an additional layer of complexity because I think the forgiveness period on those, you know, by the time we sort of get through mid-year um, or possibly before, I'm not sure, uh, we may start to see forgiveness on that second round of, of PPP. And as Harris said in his prepared remarks, um, you know, we have seen uh, a lot of applications coming in on that second round of the program. And it's really important for us you know, to be open and available um, to our communities to really help them out um, uh, with the program. And so we're, you know, we're all very focused on doing that. Okay, great. Just one uh, follow-up question uh, to Brad's question on the, uh, the guidance on the adjusted non-interest expense. So that, you know, in order to be the guidance of being flat in 2021, it's based on the 2020 adjusted net interest income that's on that slide. So it really just excludes the pension expense from that, right? So it's like a billion six seventy as the base to compare from. So, well, there's two ways to do it. Um, you know, one is to look at the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, because that slide is you know kind of fourth quarter to fourth quarter comparison. Um, and I think what we're saying is, look, the fourth quarter. You know, by the time you get to the fourth quarter next year, it's roughly consistent. The other thing, as we say on the slide, um, and we're pretty explicit about that, that we expect the full year 21 gap non-interest expense to be approximately stable with the fiscal year uh, gap um, non-interest expense uh, figure, which, you know, we say right on the slide is $1.7 billion. Okay, so, so does that imply that there's, you know, some non-gap expenses, maybe another charitable contribution similar to what you had in 2020? 
Uh, yeah, so not, sorry, not, not to imply that. Uh, we're just trying to come up with it. There are a couple different ways that you triangulate on the same number. We're expecting um, expenses, adjusted expenses, to be about $1.7 billion in, um, uh, in 2021. Got it. Okay, that, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Steve Moss with B. Riley Securities. Uh, good afternoon. Just uh, one follow-up question for me on the allowance for credit losses here. You know, the $59 million uh, decline related to portfolio changes. You know, you've had a lot of loan growth here driven by municipal and owner-occupied over the past 12 months. So kind of wondering, you know, do we think about that, you know, a good component of that $59 million being stable as we head into the first half of 20, 2021 in terms of reserve relief? So I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Could you repeat it? Oh, sure. So just on the slide 15 with the $59 million uh, reduction in the ACL from portfolio changes, you, you guys mentioned there are new loans and portfolio mix as two of the drivers. And just looking at, you know, growth over the past four quarters has been driven by municipal loans and, you know, owner occupied CRE. So I'm thinking if that continues into 2021, do we see a good chunk of that uh, $59 million reserve relief that we saw this quarter continue into the first half of 2021? Well, I, I, um, I, I can't necessarily say that it continues, but what I can't, you're picking up on the theme, which is to the extent we are growing parts of the portfolio that are less risky, that absolutely has an impact um, on sort of the overall average allowance for credit loss, you know, relative to loans. The other really important factor, though, that I uh, that we mentioned in the slide, and it's a really important factor I don't want to overlook, to the extent, you know, loan growth has slowed, the existing portfolio is shortening. And, you know, under CECL, one of the key sort of um, key determinants of the allowance for credit loss is the lifetime of, of the loans. And as loans move through time, the probability of default decreases. So to the extent that we've got a shortening portfolio uh, from an average life perspective, that also absolutely has an impact on the allowance for credit loss. Well, okay. certainly, certainly the quality bar on that page, page 15, slide 15, you know, assuming uh, the pandemic, we start to see a recovering economic, um, level, uh, economic activity, uh, there's that, that credit quality uh, improvement should be reflected there as well. Much All more right, thank you very much. Saw it in the fourth quarter. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions. So with that, I'll turn the call back over to Director of Investor Relations, James Abbott, for any closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you joining us for the fourth quarter earnings call uh, for 2020. Uh, we look forward to seeing you and speaking with you uh, in, in the near term. If you have any follow-up questions, I will be around this evening and tomorrow and so forth to take any of those questions, please just reach out to me uh, at the number at the top of the press release. Thank you, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating, and you may now disconnect.